Hello, welcome to the second part of this lesson about the moment of a force or torque. I'm assuming you've seen and understood part one. Part two was originally going to cover both the center of gravity and using it in moment calculations and the principle of moments. But I decided that would make part two a bit too long for a single video. So I've split it into two separate videos 2a, which is what you're looking at now, will consider center of gravity. 2b, and then if you want to watch it, part 3, are separate videos. And you may want to try one or two questions for yourself and think about them. A pen and paper will be handy, but you don't need a calculator. Let's start. What is the center of gravity of an object? Well, here's a simple object. It's a side view of a block. Each part of this block has got its own weight. So each part of any object has its own weight. And we could think about the object even in terms of the separate atoms. Well, obviously not to scale, but here are separate atoms shown. Each atom's got its own weight. I could mark them all in, but there'd be too many arrows. So I'll just mark a few of the weights in. Now, if you have to do a calculation involving the object's weight, you don't want to have to think about the weight of each atom separately. You want an overall weight in the right position that you can use instead of the separate weights. So what we do is this. We say the weights, the separate small weights, can be combined into a single force, which is the total weight of the object. And we can think of this total weight as acting from the average position of all the other little weights. So the total weight can be thought of as acting from a single point, and this point is called the center of gravity of the object. Let me show you. Look at the object. Let's get rid of the separate little weights. I haven't shown them all, just showing you a few, remember? But we're going to get rid of them and replace them. This is the total weight, and it's basically the magnitude of it is the weight of all the little atoms joined added together. And the position where it starts from here is the average position of where all the individual small weights started from. Now this point where the arrow starts here is right in the middle because I've drawn a nice symmetrical object. And that point is called the center of gravity of the object. And you can think of a single force acting from that point instead of all the little forces on the individual atoms. Here's a couple of questions for you. There's a dumbbell shape and there's a donut shape. The mathematical term is a torus, hole in the middle. If you were asked to mark the weight on each of those objects, where would you draw the weight arrow? Pause if you want to think about that. And I hope you would draw them here. For the center of gravity will be right in the middle, so you draw that. For the torus, the center of gravity is actually in the middle of the hole you would draw that. And you may ask yourself, well, is the center of gravity always simply in the middle of an object? And the answer is, it depends. The center of gravity of an object is the point in the middle, the geometrical center, providing some conditions are satisfied. First of all, providing the object is symmetrical, like these. Providing the object has a uniform density, that means the same density at all parts. It's no use if the left sphere is lead and the right sphere is polystyrene, then the average position of the total weight is way over to the left. So we're assuming symmetry and uniform density. And we're also making a third assumption, we're assuming that the object is in a uniform gravitational field, so that the strength of gravity is the same everywhere in the object about 9.8 meters per second squared. We'll mention that again in a moment. Here's a couple of other things to think about. Object on the left is, is made of material with a higher density at the top than the bottom. Here's an object that hasn't got a regular shape. It's a triangle. So your task, if you want to pause the video, can you estimate the positions of the center of gravities of these objects and decide where you would mark their weights. Pause if you want to try that. Well, I hope you can see in the first one, the center of gravity will be somewhere above the geometrical center because the top end is higher density material. It weighs more than the material at the bottom end for, a, say, for the same volume per 
cubic centimetre, say. This one, you have to use a bit of judgment. The centre of gravity will be around there. And you could imagine this shape cut out in cardboard. If you tried balancing it on your finger, the centre of gravity to make it balance would have to be directly over your fingertip. Now there are ways to calculate the positions of the centre of gravity given enough information, but that's not what we're doing here. We're just trying to get a grasp of what it means. Let's give you a definition. The centre of gravity of an object is the point from which the object's entire weight can be considered to act. That's quite a good definition. Remember it's basically an average position. It's the average of all the other weights positions. OK, now a problem for you to solve. Here's a, a seesaw. It's nicely balanced without anything on it. We're going to put two objects on it. These two objects are identical. So let me read this. Two identical uniform blocks, that means that the same density, haven't got one end denser than the other, two identical uniform blocks, same size, same shape, are placed as shown. So one's on the narrow base and one's on its side. The question is this, does the seesaw stay balanced, tilt clockwise, or tilt anti-clockwise? Pause the video, look at the diagram carefully, and see if you can work it out. I hope you've done that. Let me go through it. First step would be to mark the weights of each of the blocks. Well, the weights of the same magnitude, and they act from the centre of gravity, which is in the middle, because we've got uniform blocks. Now look at the diagram. Let's make it easier by drawing in the lines of action of those two weights. The green lines are the lines of action. I hope you remember how to work out a moment. What you do is multiply the force by the perpendicular distance from the pivot to the line of action. Let me mark in the relevant distances. So from the pivot to the left line of action, I've called that D1. From the pivot to the right line of action, I've called that D2. And I hope you can see I've made D1 a little bit bigger than D2. It should be clear that D1 is bigger than D2. Let's write that down. Now, how big is the anti-clockwise moment? Well, it's going to be the weight times D1. How big is the clockwise moment? It's going to be the same weight times D2. And I hope you can see that weight times D1, which is anti-clockwise moment, is bigger than the weight times D2, which is the clockwise moment, because the weights are equal and D1 is bigger than D2. That means the anti-clockwise moment wins. It's bigger than the clockwise. That will cause the seesaw to tilt anti-clockwise. The left-hand end goes down. OK, let's mention the term centre of mass. It's one you'll come across. If you have an object that's made up of atoms, the average position of all the masses is called the centre of mass. The average position of the masses of the different parts of an object. And you might say, well, isn't that the same as centre of gravity? Well, it's not quite the same. You could have an object in outer space in zero gravity. It can't have a centre of gravity because there's no weight, there's no gravity, but it can still have a centre of mass. And the centre of mass in this particular example is right in the middle, often abbreviated to COM, centre of mass. So you're going to say, aren't you? I can tell what your next question is, but that's just the same as the centre of gravity. Well, it is sometimes. Centre of gravity and centre of mass are the same point providing we are in a uniform gravitational field. So if we're near the surface of the Earth, the Earth's gravitational field is as near as, damn it, uniform. It's the same everywhere, as long as we don't go into outer space a long way from the Earth. So in that particular situation, if we're in a uniform gravitational field, the centre of gravity and the centre of mass are the same point, right bang in the middle of this symmetrical uniform object. But you can get situations where they're not the same. For example, the centre of gravity and centre of mass can be different in a non-uniform gravitational field. Let me show you. Suppose you've got a weak gravitational field at the top of the object, 
drawn a small purple arrow there to remind you, and a strong gravitational field at the bottom of the object. I hope you realise the atoms on the top row will not weigh very much because they're in a weak gravitational field. But the atoms on the bottom row will weigh rather more because they're in a strong gravitational field. So most of the weight is in the lower half of the object. That means the centre of gravity of the object will be below the centre of mass. Now, you won't have to deal with that in problems, but I've included it just because I think you should know the difference between centre of gravity and centre of mass. This is a physics lesson. OK, let's do a final problem. Here's a block resting on the ground. Let's suppose the block is 4 metres tall and 3 metres across. Now, if we push the block a bit, we can make it tilt. We could tilt the base so it's at an angle theta to the horizontal ground. If theta is small, the block will return. If I make theta larger than a certain angle, the block will topple over onto its side. So the question is this. At what angle theta can the uniform block be tilted before it topples over? In other words, how big can you make theta? If you made theta any bigger than that limiting value, it would cause it to fall over. How big is that limiting value? Now, to help you along, here's some data which may or may not help you. So I'd like you to pause the video. You may want to sketch that out for yourself and think about it. What angle can we have before the block topples onto its side? Pause and have a go. Well, I hope you've given that some good thought. Let's go over it. First of all, there's our block standing normally. The center of gravity is in the middle. It's a uniform block. Weight acts downwards. Suppose I tilt it only through a small angle. The theta is a small angle. Well, the center of gravity is here. Now the clever bit. Notice the effect of the, cent of the weight of the object. The weight of the object will produce an anti-clockwise moment. It will try making the block rotate anti-clockwise about the pivot, which is the bottom right-hand corner. That would make the block return onto its base. So it's not going to topple over, it's just going to return. That's because the weight acts through the base. It's to the left of this pivot point. We can put that into words. Tilt the block clockwise through a small angle. The weight produces an anti-clockwise moment about the pivot. If you look at the diagram, think about it, that makes sense. This causes the block to fall back, to return to its original position. It hasn't toppled over. What would happen if we made the angle big? Well, suppose I make it that big, as shown. I hope you can see what's going to happen now. The weight is now still acting from the center of gravity, but the weight is outside the base. It's on the right-hand side of that pivot point, the corner. And the effect of the weight is to produce a clockwise moment about the pivot. That will cause the block to tipple over. Put that into words. Tilt the block clockwise through a large angle. The weight produces a clockwise moment about the pivot. Look at the diagram, make sure you understand that. This causes the block to topple onto its side. So I hope you can see that the critical point is this. If we've got this angle just right, the center of gravity will be right over the pivot, the corner point. That means the weight is neither causing a clockwise nor anti-clockwise rotation. It's got zero moment. The distance from the line of action to the force, the line of action of the force, which is a thin white line, the distance from the line of action to the pivot is zero. It goes through the pivot. There is no moment. And that's a critical angle. If the angle is smaller than that, it returns. If the angle is bigger than that, it will topple onto its side. Now take a look at this. A little bit of geometry is needed. The left side of the block is a right angle triangle. We know that's 3 meters, that's 4 meters. Let me just read out what I've typed here. 
When the centre of gravity of the block is directly over the pivot, there is no moment, and this gives the limiting angle. Now, how do we work out the value of the angle? Bit of simple geometry. Look at the diagram carefully. This angle is theta. This angle is 90 minus theta. So the angle at the top is theta. I hope you know that tan theta is the opposite over the adjacent. So it's this length, which is 3, divided by this length, which is 4. So we know that the tangent of the angle theta is 3 over 4. Let's write that down. Tan theta is 3 over 4, which is 0 0.75. Theta is tan minus 1, or arctangent. 0.75. Well, I've given you the data here. If you look down the table, you see that tan 37 is 0.75. So that gives us theta must be 37 degrees. And this sort of problem occurs in question papers, in exams. It's a stability problem. How much can you tilt something before it falls over? The critical angle is the angle given by the center of gravity being directly over the pivot. OK, well, I hope you have a grasp of center of gravity and how it impacts problems using moments. In the second part of part two, we'll be talking about the principle of moments to and to use it to do some problem solving. So I hope you've enjoyed this. Thank you for watching and I hope you watch the later parts.